This is compost tea. This has been brewing since about four o'clock yesterday. So we're a little over 24 hours. I'll get into the nitty gritty of this um, on the presentation. I say nitty gritty, it's, it's gonna be kind of rapid fire. We're gonna try to cover a whole lot in an hour and a half. I always do this, like try to squeeze in too much. But uh, I did want to show this so I could cut it off and then uh, and we'd have some quiet inside. But what I'm doing is two different uh, aerated compost teas here that we can use to inoculate biochar. This is a method for um, taking the microbes that are inside compost or inside um, worm castings or whatever kind of starter material you want to use. And then you feed it some sugars and uh, feed it some uh, other micronutrients. And then you're gonna bubble that compost with air for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature. And I would recommend that you start with the recipe and you try to stick to it as close as possible. I'm happy to share the recipe that I got. So what I've been doing is compost here, alfalfa meal, fish meal, molasses, liquid fish. I've got some minerals, azomite, this stuff called C90. I've got two different systems that I made. This is the one that I did last year that if you look at it, it's, um, just a bucket with holes punched in through the bottom. And then uh, there's slightly smaller holes in the outside diameter of this tube. So I really kind of squeeze those in there real tight. And it actually gets a little bit of a swirl effect going. So what I can do is actually just dump everything into the bucket, which is nice. I do get some little pockets of compost kind of building up in these inside corners. It's also a little messy. So I switched over to the new, kind of more common system over here. One thing about bubbling all this air into it is a prevention, a safeguard against anaerobic microbes, which are generally your disease carrying microbes. Not all anaerobes, but, but of the ones that you need to be worried about, 99% of them are anaerobes. So that's why we go through all this great effort of actually bubbling air into the system so only aerobic microbes can survive. That's pretty important. So what will happen now that I've cut this off is I might have about an hour or so before my populations of microbes in here will start to crash completely. What I wanted to do was go ahead and shut the air off so we can have a nice quiet presentation. And we'll actually just go ahead and soak some biochar right now. All right, this is the other system here. Um, probably the more common system that you're gonna see involves a little air inlet that's actually manifolded down here. I've uh, built this thing out of uh, CPVC pipe, and then I went through and I drilled all these little holes down here. Mm -hmm. So as air comes in, it actually just kind of bubbles out in a nice like 12 part manifold. And then I've got these little bags. I forget what these are normally used for, but I did find these at Ingalls. Pretty nice, I put all my ingredients into the bag and then it just steeps. It's not like a violent rolling bubble like this. I suspect that I'm gonna have a little bit better results with this because it's not quite so violent. It's like a nice gentle roll. So I might have a nice like uh, microbial rich, fungal rich compost that goes in. Uh, but what I suspect is happening is I'm taking fungal strands and just tearing them all apart, you know. Um, in this case, I think the fungal strands are probably pretty well gently being uh, massaged in this little uh, bag that we have here. Do you mean like mycelium? Is that what you're referring to? Or, or like, when you say fungal strands? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So again, both these, uh, these are made with identical recipes, um, with the exception of some high, uh, high tech designer microbes that we added to one of these. And we did some comparisons on the microscope. In the 24 hours time, uh, we really didn't notice any kind of difference yet. If anything, the designer microbes may have some uh, um, effect where they're actually kind of like, it, it looks like the microbes are clumping together for some reason or another. So it's uh, interesting. Point is, and I'm gonna like stress this over and over again, is that you, you probably don't need to go after the fancy designer microbes. Um, for the most part, you can do this. If you're doing worm castings or compost and you're good at it, then that would be a, a sufficient source of microbes for inoculating biochar. Do you have all this information online? I do, I do. Yeah, sorry to skip ahead. So we'll, we'll go in and do the presentation. All of this will make a lot more sense an hour from now. <laughs> so, um, so what I want to do is uh, go ahead and soak some biochar and go ahead and get this stuff good because remember I said populations are likely to die. Haven't fed them in a while. One question. All right, so this is char that we got right off of our system. Not screened at all. Actually, in most cases, if we were going to sell this char, I would try to maybe screen it down about a quarter inch or so. 
this stuff has a pretty good profile except for some random nuggets that get through that might be like an inch or inch and a half even sometimes. Maybe pull those out if I notice it during this process. It's a good chance those are going to float. Now how did you brush that? This piece of equipment behind you here, you know, we're dealing with quantities where we might make up to two yards a day crushed by a char. We use the same shredder vacuum that you see on some of these landscaping trailers. Be seeing where the guys go around in the city and they'll suck up leaf piles. Yeah, we use one of those. So that's a good indicator if our biochar is good or not. Um, that's really one of our first indicators is, is it light enough to be picked up by the vacuum? And if it's not light enough, it's chances are that it's not completely cooked. So I'll start with that. And then uh, right now I'm just gonna dump out this tea and just kind of let it seep for a little bit. See how much that absorbed already. Biochar is actually hydrophobic at first. You know, often when you first make it, um, could be that it has um, uh, really tiny pockets of air inside of it that'll cause it to float sometimes. Um, it could also be that during the process that um, uh, tars can actually recondense on the char when it's finished especially in these batch retort systems that most people are doing. If anybody's doing this in 55 gallon drums, there's a good chance that when you're done that tars will recondense on the biochar and actually plug holes. What we do is um, wet it. It's the process called wetting where um, water makes its way into those little pores, forces oxygen out, and then it's uh, more likely to take on microbes and nutrients after that. So this stuff's been sitting around for a very long time. This char is actually probably, I want to say six months old. So it's already wetted. If this was brand new, made it yesterday char, there's a good chance a lot of it would be floating right now. You don't have to wet it right away. Can you say something about an hour? The start? Yeah, oh, with the compost tea? Yeah, you want to, if you're going to cut the air off on your compost tea, um, compost tea gets incredibly complicated. But when you cut the air off, you, you have a pretty limited amount of time before microbe populations start to die off. And the idea with compost tea is to take a starter compost and then grow the organisms out. Like you want to take, you, you can multiply the microbes that are in compost something like a thousand fold just by feeding it molasses and then bubbling air into it for a prescribed amount of time. I do have some links to a compost tea manual. If anybody gets really into this, I'd be happy to share that with you. I bet we could do a whole day on just compost tea alone. Okay, so I'm gonna let that sit for a little while. You guys wanna start the presentation? Okay, so we're talking about um, conditioning biochar. Um, we're gonna go through a little bit of uh, definitions here at first, and then we'll get into some real, really practical at home ways to do this. Biochar is biomass, wood in our case, that's been heated up in a limited oxygen environment. And basically what you're doing at that point is making charcoal. We generally heat it up a little bit further than what most commercial charcoal makers are doing. So what we're trying to do is drive everything in the wood that's not carbon out. And then well, simultaneously what happens is the carbon structure inside the wood rearranges and now what we have is this really persistent, non-biodegradable carbon um, sponge, basically, that works on a microbial level. It's incredibly small pores. It's pretty fascinating. So what makes biochar so fascinating is those two qualities. It's incredibly porous and it resists microbial degradation in the soil literally for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Very adsorptive, so what that means is that nutrients can actually stick to the walls of biochar and, and, and stay there um, and can serve as uh, microbial or plant food. So it has a uh, buffering capacity in that manner. They are sometimes alkaline. I've measured biochar that we've made here in one of our systems that uh, has a pH as high as nine. 
So consider that if you're adding that to um, soils that, um, that would not benefit from further alkalinin. Again, we usually crush it and screen it to about a quarter inch or so. Uh, would save the larger nuggets and, and recrush it again. Here's that picture under the electron microscope. What we're talking about today is three different things. We're talking about biochar, which is a substrate, right? It's just a house. Think of it as a, as a house for um, nutrients and microbes follow the nutrients into the house and what they have is a, uh, a protected environment from disruptions from outside. So like um, heavy water events or drought and um, disturbance in the soil like tilling or um, over fertilizing, under fertilizing. Um, biochar is going to have a, um, uh, a neutralizing effect on all of those. Um, what happens when we put biochar um, directly in the soil without charging it? If I was to go out into my garden and apply 5% biochar to my topsoil, chances are I'm not going to have a very good crop next year because it's going to come in and it's going to pull all the nutrients in my topsoil. It's going to hold on to them. It may take a year. It may take two years to recover. And that's if I have good soil with high organic matter and a, a nice microbial population in it already. Dead soils, damaged soils, it's not likely to do much of anything uh, until it has microbes in it and something to eat. So again, that's what we're talking about. Nutrients, microbes. Don't forget that. Nutrients and microbes. Biochar is interesting because you can get into this really heady science where um, you can have a specific plant or a specific type of plant with specific needs and you can use biochar as the vehicle for delivering specific nutrients and specific microbes to that specific soil ecosystem that you're trying to build. Um, we we'll probably won't get into that too much. Um, the compost tea brewing manual describes that in some detail. If anybody's interested, happy to share. It's important to note that in most cases, nature will correct itself. Like I said, you can apply it raw. Just be prepared to wait and have a pretty um, um, disappointing crop for maybe a couple of years. Who's heard of indigenous microbes? I talk about these designer microbes and building specific soils and that kind of thing. Now there's a good chance that the microbes in your soil are gonna outcompete all these fancy microbes that we're loading in to the biochar. Indigenous microbes is certainly something to look at. Basically has something to do with sourcing good soil in a um, environment similar to the one that you're trying to recreate. So the example that I hear all the time is growing blueberries. If you want to grow blueberries, go find somebody that has a healthy, productive blueberry crop and ask if you can borrow a little bit of their soil. Okay, so you're going to be sourcing microbes that are um, uh, symbiotic with blueberry crops. Soil food web, it's the uh, complex relationship between soil organisms. Basically, uh, what we're going to be looking for today in, in regards to biochar is diversity. Every step of the way, we're going to try to add diversity. And that is really what's fundamental to the soil food web, where if um, uh, something uh, affects nematodes in this soil food web, that there's another organism that will come in there and kind of fill its place, and that it's a complex relationship where we can deal with a little bit of disruption, drought and excessive rain, over-application of fertilizers, whatever. Guidelines here throughout the rest of the class, we're going to consider nutrients and microbes. Diversity. Char needs to be wetted. Okay, we already discussed that. The char is uh, hydrophobic at first. Now, what happens if you take char that hasn't been wetted and you want to top dress around your apple trees? It didn't stay there for a long time. I've actually used it like mulch. Yeah? Okay. Well, that's good. I was going to say it might float away. Yeah. In a big rain event, you're just going to see it wash down the, you know, down the gully. Yeah, but, you know, if it gets wetted through periodic light rains, then, um, then you're probably going to be okay. Application rates. I'll just go ahead and discuss that. I've heard wildly different recommendations for application rates, kind of depending on who you are. If you're like a down-home farmer making your own biochar in buckets, or if you're like, a, you know, Cornell University scientist, you're going to have different recommendations. Um, one to 10% by volume, you're probably not going to get much of an effect over 10% by volume anywhere. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind moving forward. Um, again, we're going to maintain aerobic conditions whenever possible. So um, here's just a little tip. Um, 
for you guys that are making it at home is, um, yeah, I know some of you guys have these systems where you've got drums where you can let it cool off. You don't actually have to quench it. And there are some systems where you need to be there to quench it or else it's going to just smolder and turn to ash. Um, I would recommend if you have the opportunity to quench it. So um, what happens when you pour water over hot coals? You, for one, you're going to create a ton of steam, so be careful. It's going to be incredibly dangerous. Um, but that steam is going to come inside, and it's going, to, it's going to enter those little pores in the biochar, and it's going to crack them out even further. And in some cases, remember I talked about the tars that might condense on biochar? It's going to actually, in some cases, possibly dissolve those tars and wash them out. Um, so you, what you're going to end up is this wetting and cracking process all in one that'll make your char way more absorptive. It's actually a, a process of how they make activated carbon, which is in like a Brita filter or um, fish tanks commonly use activated carbon. Uh, steam cracking is one way to make activated carbon. Something you can do that gets really interesting is you can take like a, um, a soluble um, mineral additive like C90. Remember I mentioned C90 outside? That's a collection of something like 200 different ocean minerals that have been dried and you can add a tablespoon of C90, I think it's to five gallon bucket, and use that water to quench your char and now what you're doing is injecting sea minerals into the deepest pores of the char. It's pretty interesting. That's what I do in my compost tea is one tablespoon to five gallons. We're talking about conditioning that's preparing biochar for soil application through nutrients, microbes, minerals. Broadly speaking, microbes are microorganisms. When I'm talking about microbes, I'm talking about soil life. Quantity, diversity of microbial life. Aerobes are those that require oxygen. Anaerobes require the absence of oxygen. In the most cases, remember, we're going to try to avoid anaerobes. Facultative are those that can actually switch between the two. When I talk about nutrients, I mean microbial foods or plant foods. We're going to talk a lot about organic matter which is humus or little tiny bits of plants, microbes included, the waste from microbes, all of this is organic matter in the soil. Okay. Cover crops exudates. You yeah. know, our experience was that not charging it, but plant, putting it out with very diverse cover crops that have been inoculated with both mycorrhizal and rhizobium inoculant, I mean inoculants, allowed the charging to happen in the soil way more quickly than we expected within six months. So diverse, diverse cover crops after the fact, even if you don't get a charge, you might get away with it. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> We've only seen it once. Yeah. yeah, more science is needed. Okay, the easiest way to do compost or to do biochar inoculation, this is across the board. A lot of times if you're going to go and you're going to try to buy biochar, what it's going to be is biochar that has been mixed with compost. Okay. So what we can do is take a handful of biochar, fresh off the machine, and a handful of compost, and we can take them and just mix them all up together. Okay, there's a couple of things to factor in when you're doing this. For one, it has to be a, a right moisture. And that moisture is um, uh, generally described as, as the, in the squeeze test. If you can take that ball of charcoal, biochar, and... Um, compost and you can squeeze it just to the point where a little bit of water comes through your fingers. That's the right moisture, okay? If you can get it to that point with moisture and you can keep it warm and you can keep it in a um, uh, aerobic environment, you know, don't put it in a sealed bucket, but keep it in like a perforated bag, something like that. And then eventually in time, maybe over the course of a couple of weeks, you're going to have inoculated biochar. You're going to have nutrients and you're going to have microbes in one step. Absolutely the easiest way to do it. Um, a, a caveat there is that um, how do you know that you have good compost? Really hard to tell. Um, uh, a lot of inferior compost out there. Making compost is difficult. Making it right is, is pretty difficult. Not at all something we're going to be able to talk about today. Um, again, wait a few weeks. You know, you can't use your biochar tomorrow if you do it this way. I say that from experience. I've done this a handful of times and I have done it enough and get willy-nilly enough about it that I've definitely seen some inferior results by applying biochar in the first year this way. 
Um, almost always these days, I'm taking biochar and I'm using some sort of liquid nutrient source or biological inoculant first, and then I'm gonna add it to my compost, right? Um, biochar, it's, it is really hard to wrap your head around how absorptive biochar really is, but it can hold and suck in a lot of nutrients. And, and I'll say, point in case, this thing in the back here, um, we've had that run in for uh, about two months now. Um, that is our aquaponics system that we're, we're experimenting with. Aquaponics is where you grow fish and you grow plants in the same closed loop system where the fish waste goes to feed the plants. I've had fish in there for almost two months, and last week I pulled all the plants out because there's no nutrition in there. That, bio, that thing is, and what I'm doing is using biochar as a substrate to grow the plants on, and that biochar is just sucking in all of the plant waste, or the fish waste. None of it is available to the fish, or to the plants right now. Okay, so that's two months of having fish in there, feeding it waste. I can get in there with my little test files, no ammonia. No nitrates, no nitrites, nothing is available to the plants. They look terrible. So I just pulled them out. What I'm gonna do is just give that probably a couple of months to actually charge up. I've got some interesting theories about maybe using uh, biochar. This is a side note. We've got a really over-fertilized pond at the other um, farm. What I wanna do is take biochar and, and have some sort of system where I can take that over-fertilized water and just bubble it through the biochar. Take that biochar, load it with pond nutrients, then bring it over here and use it in my closed loop fish system. So that's one clever way to clean up a pond and load biochar, use it in my fish. When I'm done with that system, I've got inoculated charged biochar that I can add to compost or probably just add directly to soils. So once you've got your biochar made, how long do you have to let it sit? You don't really have to let it sit. You gotta cool it off, it can't be hot. You can put it in the soil. Yeah, you, you're going to want to charge it or inoculate it first, and then you can put it directly. After you, after you inoculate it. Yeah, I mean, certain processes are going to have longer times. So the one I, I'm talking about now with compost, you're going to want to let it sit and go through a composting phase that may take a week or two for microbes to move in. So if you're just going to mix it with compost, get moisture right, get heat right, and make sure it has adequate air movement. So if it gets dry, you're going to have to add some moisture. Exactly. For those of you guys who, who are or aren't composting at home, um, you may know that composting at home is a lot easier when you've got a large mass. If I'm going to compost at home, I do it once a year, and I do it in a large, like, two or three yard mass. It's the last time I mow the grass, and it's when I harvest and I clean up my garden, and it's right when the leaves start to fall. So I try to do that all at once, and then I can get two or three yards of material, and then I can throw raw biochar in there and go through that whole process. One last note, speaking from experience, is that, um, you know, I mentioned you can do a one-to-one -one ratio compost to uh, raw biochar. In most cases, I'll layer on the side of caution now that I've seen that not work for me, and I'll add um, more compost. So I, I'll generally do like a three-to-one now. And if I've got a three-to-one compost and biochar bucket, for a four-gallon bucket, let's make that easy, I've got one gallon of biochar. So remember, I can add one to 10% biochar pie volume to my garden. Um, you, you're talking about that one gallon of biochar. Okay, you might have four gallons quantity, but it's only one gallon of biochar. Just for fun, we've got a microscope here on the farm. Uh, I did take a picture of our compost. This is the compost that we have here. So what I've done is actually screen that through a quarter inch, this guy here. And uh, it turns out real nice. I don't you know if you guys want to mess with it. It'll make your hands so brown if you touch it. Um, really nice texture. Nice fungal activity. That's what we're looking for in, as much as possible in our compost. That's because bacteria is never hard to get. Yeah. You get the bacteria all the time. The fungal's hard to get. Mm -hmm. We got a little picture of a nice little fungal strand right here. Remember I was talking out there, I was showing you my compost tea bubblers and one has this really violent bubble. In the real violent bubble, this thing will be all shredded to bits. This might be from the violent bubble because that's not a very long fungal strand. And that looks like a little bit of fungal strand over there off on the edge. Do y'all see that? Mm -hmm. I told you I compost once a year. Um, you know, I generate food waste every single day. Um, I do want to spend a little time on this worm composting because I'm a, 
a huge fan of it. How are you doing it? Three bucket system and then all my food scraps. Yeah. Well, not all of them. They can't eat all of it. Yeah. As much as they'll eat. They're fickle little creatures at first. That's, that's been my experience is that it takes a minute to get them established. Once they get rocking though, I mean, you can feed them all day long. And um, uh, it's, it's a nice system. It's, it, it's scalable. You can do it as small as this. You could probably do it smaller than that. Or you can scale up to these large wooden bins. Um, uh, I, for one, like multiple small bins because I can move them around. I'll move these outside under my shady back porch in the summertime. And uh, once you get it going, it doesn't stink at all. Um, actually, I just move them into my basement. Uh, six months out of the year, they live in my basement. They do need that um, uh, you know, comfortable range of temperature. Um, try to keep them above 55. Don't let it get too hot. I kept them in my garage. My garage gets up to 80 degrees or so. It gets a lot of sun. If you leave the door open, um, I have absolutely cooked my worms before um, by getting too hot. Moisture manager is critical. If you feed them too much food scraps at once or you get the, the thermophilic compost going um, where you actually start to generate heat, you can cook your worms uh, that way as well. So it's a, a tricky system. Once you get it right, it gets really easy. Um, you cannot put dairy in it. You cannot put fat. You cannot put citrus, salty foods, spicy foods. Just stay away from them. This compost system, again, it does not get hot. You're relying on the worms, in this case, to, um, to be your, your pathogen reducers. So the way that you manage it from keeping it from heating up is, is more carbon than usual. I, for one, uh, alternate between two sources of grit. Um, worms in this bucket, it, they need uh, uh, something. They're, they're just like a chicken. I might be wrong on this, but I think I'm right. Like a chicken's gizzard requires a little bit of grit to chew its food. I believe that worms operate the same way. They do. Yeah. So, um, so what I like to do is just uh, occasionally, maybe once a month or something, I'll, I'll drop in a little bit of... Uh, gritty material, either a rock dust, like a mineralized rock dust, or, um, or the crushed eggshells. So um, these are eggshells. What I'll do um, most of the time is if I've got a, enough eggshells, I'll uh, either like stick them on the wood stove or sometimes even in the microwave for a minute and just um, zap all the bacteria on those eggshells that have been sitting around for a couple of weeks and then uh, get them nice and dry and I'll just pulverize them into this. Um, this, this is actually a lot of eggshells, you know, that's probably 12 dozen eggshells in there. Um, and I'll just take a little bit and just sprinkle it in there occasionally. Now I read, preparing for this class, I read that, that the calcium in the eggshells is actually a buffer for organic acid. Organic acid is another one of those um, indicators that um, if your bedding gets too acidic, your worms are going to leave, right? And it gets acidic when you overfeed it. So it's just any kind of buffer that you can have to, to neutralize that soil in there, make your worms happy, it'll, it'll pay off. If I've got a lot of veggies, I'll, I'll chop them up into small bits before I put them in there. I like to take that extra step. Don't put like your mango pit in there. Worms are never gonna eat a mango pit. Okay, this is my system at home. And I brought in one of these buckets. I've got four buckets. Most of the time I'm only using two of them. This one's full to the brim right now. This one I just harvested a lot out of. Um, when I did all my uh, spring planting in my garden. And it's that one right there. So it's nice and light. This is finished worm casting. So if I get a full bucket like this, a lot of times if I don't need those worm castings right away, I'll screen them and then I'll just store them in here. I'll leave a couple of worms in there just to, to keep it nice and aerated. And then this is the overs from that process. When I screen it, the stuff that goes through the screen goes here, the stuff that goes, uh, stays on top of the screen goes in here and then I'll use this whenever I start a new bin. I'll use the microbes that are all over the overs and then, and then try to inoculate a new band. So let me show you what I got here. If anybody wants to, to stand up and look at this, I'm happy to, happy to show you. A lot of times what I'll do is um, uh, add food to one side. So I'm, I'm guessing I added food to this side. And um, I'll do that by taking the worm bin and kind of turning it up putting it over there, and then I'll sprinkle my food in there. Try not to overload it. Again, you can, you'll, with experience, you'll get to know when you overload it. 
And then I'll take something like my eggshells, just kind of sprinkle it in there. Now, can it be earthworms, or does it have to be a specific worm? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so I use red wigglers. Okay. Yeah, that's like if you go to any bait shop or any of these gas stations that sell bait, you can just ask for red wigglers. Um, or you can just ask me. If you want some red wigglers, oh, we'll harvest some tonight for you. Take it home. Um, they grow really fast, too. So if you get a little bit, you know, they, they're, there they are. Yeah, see them down there? Yeah. So they're staying down low now. What are you looking for to say it's, it's finished? Uh, well, that's a really good question, too. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure that I really know, um, other than what I can just see. I don't see bits of food anymore. I see a really consistent texture. Um, it's fine. It doesn't stink. You know, In some cases, if you get it wrong, you'll get little pockets of moisture down in the bottom of this that kind of do stink. See how it actually looks a little wetter down there at the bottom? See, I don't know why all my worms want to stay down there at the bottom. That's uh, something to pay attention to. So, when you think it's ready, you just take worms and all? Yeah. And use them? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times what I'll do is screen it. And then for the most part, the worms will stay on top of the screen. Then I'll try to add them back in if I can. What are you using as like a starter material? Or is that all vegetation? Well, this bin is like three years old now. Um, I'll show you what, I, what I'm using now is... In, you're going to hate me for this, is um, finely shredded leaves. Um, we, we built a shredder out here, and one thing I did was last year, just kind of testing the shredder out on different materials. Um, I, I had big bags of leaves, partially rotted leaves, left over from a prior year. So it's already partially rotted, ran that stuff through the shredder, and it's like so nice. It's yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, I started out with just shredded cardboard, though. I mean, this system was started on cardboard. So, again, what I'll normally do is, is I'll take this stuff and I'll push it off to the side like that. I'm going to get it all mixed up now. I'll add my food, and then I'll just take that and I'll just roll it right back over. And what I end up with is a little section over here off on the side that won't have any food mixed into it. So you can take from that. So I can take, yeah, from over here. Usually I can get something that doesn't have any food. See, that's the seed that tried to germinate. Uh, I would call this done. I would take that and screen it right now and call that done. Okay, it smells good. Yeah. Um, yeah, weird little bits. See, that's a butternut squash uh, stem right there. Um, that kind of stuff, that's why you screen it, because that'll never, it never decompose in here. It might, I mean, it might eventually. Um, another thing that I'll do is just uh, throw some cardboard over the top of it. I find that, especially at first, that helps keep the bugs from uh, laying eggs on it. Like little flies come in there. Also, get one of these shovels, man. That's great. I got this at a Northern Tool from the kids section for my son, and I immediately stole it from him. <laughs> uh, a couple things about this bin, if you're curious. I've got little 16th inch holes drilled around the lid. I've got um, actually quarter inch holes on the bottom, and then I've got little 16th inch holes around the top here too. That's all you got to do. And then you might want to factor in something like uh, some sort of a, a pan, because it does uh, drip over time. The stuff that leaks out of it is not compost tea. I've been told that it is or is not good for plants. It's good for plants, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely you can use that to further inoculate biochar. Kind of, you know, it's, it's not going to have the microbial population that compost tea does but it'll certainly be uh, nutrient rich. Um, absolutely good stuff, yeah. Um, I'll show you this. This is one that we uh, started up more recently um, and we leave it here and we don't feed it very often. I mean, we just don't have the, the food scraps. We don't generate the food scraps here at lunch every day to put in here. But um, a lot fresher, a lot newer. That's the leaves that I'm talking about. So pretty nice stuff. Um, Worms are starting to grow in here, but nowhere near the population that I have here. Still doesn't stink, none of that. What's that? So, um, so to feed it, um, my dad was thinking about putting dirt, so just put leaves and... Yeah, yeah, the worms aren't going to eat dirt, you know. Right, yeah. yeah um, so you want to give them something to eat. And 
I, for one, if I, if I have the opportunity to, I like to use a waste product if I can. Well, I have this dip in, and I just throw, we just put it in and mix it up, and the worms from the ground just come up. And, but to, if we want to do that, we put it in a bin, just loose. Yeah, I don't know. Pat, do you have anything to add to that? Well, okay, so you have the no floor on the bin. Yeah. So that's a fine way to let soil biology do the, yeah. do the trick, you know. The thing about this system is that it doesn't have a way to ensure you have just castings. And that actually, I teach all the time that it's not um, compost tea to take leaf shade out because you have no way of knowing if the liquid coming from all the food waste has gone to the worm's gut. The worm's gut totally eats all the microbes. They actually feed on the microbes that might be pathogens. So if there are no pathogens that you put in there, there's no problem. But if you have to have something that like, you know, came off somebody's plate and they happen to have salmonella or something, that could then be in there and it wouldn't get eliminated unless you were sure you had nothing but the castings. And so that's the one problem with these small systems is you tend to have to like keep disturbing them. Whereas if you have a big system, you just let the stuff sit there until the worms have left it. And then on top, you know you have worm castings because they look like nothing but little round teeny teeny balls because they've all gone through a worm's gut. Yeah. So to be sure you don't have pathogens, have, being sure that it, whatever you're using went through a worm's gut is what you use. That's how to do it. The problem with the leachate is you can't be sure of that. Certainly it'll feed plants, but you may have pathogens, so you may consider that you treat it like raw manure. Yeah. If you're not worried about that, then there's no problem. You just treat it like raw manure, you know, in the rules for that are 90 days, if it doesn't touch the food, 120 if it does, then you're home free. Usually when it's this wet, um, you really can't shake it or roll it or anything, it'll just clump. But I just gently massage it, try not to um, cut up my little worms that are in there right now. And what I end up with is really nice fine textured stuff. And this is what I use to start my compost tea at most of the time. My compost at home would never be this good. <laughs> so I end up with a lot of little mud balls and stuff like this. If anybody uh, wants to, I'm happy to just, you know, if anybody wants to try to start this at home or anything, then uh, take these worms. How long will the microbes stay alive once you stop feeding them? Like you have your fourth bin and you put it away. The, does the nutrients stay and the microbes die, or do the microbes stick around for a while? I don't know. I imagine they stick around for a long time. As long as there's organic matter in there for them to feed on, as long as they have something to eat, I think they're, they're going to stick around. And maintain conditions right, you know, keep it, you know, at a moderate temperature. Give it air. That's why I said that I like to leave a little bit of worms in my finished um, worm castings, is so it doesn't you know, have any kind of tendency to collapse on itself or anything. Not even sure that it would, but I just do that as a safeguard. So it's not going to go bad. Yeah, I don't think it'll go bad unless you close it off to air completely. The one thing to watch out for is letting it dry out. Yeah. <clears throat> if it dries out down, a lot of those microbes are going to die and the rest are going to get quite dormant. Okay, I think we covered that. Good. <laughs>